Uh, this whole lecture is going to be a very developer focus more than a DevOps focus, although the tools that we're going to be using um, are very much utilized in both worlds. Um, there's going to be a little bit of an introduction here, uh, giving you a background on services or background on the architecture. And then we're going to get into an actual workshop where we're going to work through pulling down a container, running it, executing into it, doing some commands inside the container. And then we're going to build our own container. And then we're going to do the same thing with that. And then we're going to uh, um, network some services together. So, um, in, you know, in concert with this whole ship container paradigm. Here we have a sinking ship, the HMS Titanic. HMS, yeah, that's right. Um, and it's a, it's, you know, it's a good analogy because if you script your deploys using something like Ansible and you're building your production stack on your production machines, you can have, you can have uh, entirely avoidable downtime. A great example of this is we had a situation where we had, uh, had gone through an entire dev and QA pipeline. Things had been stamped and signed off. And uh, we deployed to production. And during our staging sign off and our production deploy, PyPy, which is Python's package repository, had a breaking change in the dependency that we hadn't version locked. So right, version lock your dependencies, maybe do like a pip freeze and put them in your requirements text, that's always a good idea. Uh, but if you don't do that because you, you know, didn't think of that, you can um, get in a situation where you have a breaking change and you've done all the right things through the pipeline. Uh, Docker is a really good way to avoid that because you fr basically take an artifact or snapshot of your code, of your entire uh, ecosystem for that service, and you can move it through your entire pipeline as is. So uh, here's our itinerary of adventure. I will be your captain. Come with me. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll go through a uh, brief introduction overview of Docker, why it's different from a VM, why you might use it. I think I gave a pretty good example there. Um, the Docker architecture and ecosystem. And then we're going to quickly touch on Docker images, which is sort of the foundation of Docker. And then move into a uh, real brief overview of the Docker file. Um, we're going to move into the Docker CLI. That's going to be the workshop component of this. We're going to acquire an image, run in managing images, building and running a new image, and then networking containers together. Um, if we have enough time, probably won't. Um, but we'll quickly go over Docker Compose, and it will sort of make the previous 45 minutes seem like it was entirely pointless. <laughs> so. This is a slide from Docker's website. Docker has really, really great documentation. Uh, the website doesn't burn your eyes when you read it. So I certainly encourage you to go to Docker's website, read the docs on how <coughs> uh, Docker works, uh, the Docker CLI works, how Docker files work. Uh, it goes into a lot more detail than what we're going to cover today. This slide uh, is basically showing the difference between containers and VMs. So, most people might think that a container, or an image I should say, is essentially a virtual machine. And I suppose in many ways it is. You have a snapshot of your code. Um, it's running on a host or a remote machine. But in a VM, you have a hypervisor. You usually allocate a processor. You have a pre-allocated amount of memory. Running a virtual machine is very expensive. In a container, you have this very small, lightweight, Docker file which describes your service, and you can deploy that, pull it down on a remote machine, and it runs in a single process, running uh, in the host machine's as a, as a fork from the host machine's kernel process, um, and it only uses as much memory as the process inside the container actually utilizes. So it has a low lightweight memory footprint. Um, you usually have one process per container. Um, it also in, uh, enhances your development pipeline. So I alluded, well, I talked earlier about how um, you have a snapshot of your container, a snapshot of all your code, and you can move that through your whole QA pipeline. And how many people here are in a startup with no QA pipeline? Don't be shy. <laughs> um, it's really important to have this. This really facilitates that ability for QA, even if you have few hands to do QA, to not rely on having uh, managing different ecosystems or different environments. You just have this box that you can test. Um, 
So this is a really uh, huge advantage for smaller teams as well. Uh, and as part of this, QA pipeline integrates with continuous integration and continuous delivery. So you can build your images, you can deploy them, and as they're rubber stamped uh, and go through the gating pipeline, you deploy them and off into production. So because they're these snapshots, your containers are repeatable and testable. So an image is the same image. Same image version is always the same image. It's got the same content. It's got the same environment variables. Sorry, the same uh, possible environment variables. We'll see what I mean by that in a bit. Um, and also, it's horizontally scalable. So you can take a bunch of containers. You have a single image, and you can spill up as many containers from that image as you want. OK, so um, I use the words image and container. I'm going to explain that in the slide after this. But here's the Docker architecture. So there's basically three components. There's the Docker command line interface, which is how you interact with the Docker daemon. Docker daemon is a service running on your host machine. You, Docker CLI interacts through a REST API with this daemon and executes commands uh, to uh, produce your images, run containers, uh, pull images from the Docker repository. Uh, the host is running this Docker daemon uh, and Linux. So if you're running a Mac machine or a Windows machine, Docker is running in a virtual machine, which is kind of ironic in a way, I suppose. Um, so everything still works as it would, but just a caveat being that running Docker on Mac or in a Windows machine will be actually slower, especially for iOS, um, than running natively in Linux. So the host runs and manages the images, containers, and networks, does the orchestration and ensuring that everything that this command line interface tells it to do, it does. And then finally, there's this registry, and the registry is just a public repo on the interwebs um, that has images, version images, things like Ubuntu, Redis, Elasticsearch, um, what else we got there? Uh, cover them. Um, as a whole bunch of others like Python, uh, Alpine, so Alpine being a, a very lightweight Linux distribution that we'll use in a little bit. And each of these images you just pull down and you can start utilizing uh, within a few minutes. So here's some Docker nautical nomenclature. Um, the, core, the, the core element of Docker is an image. Okay? Images are snapshots that you define in a Docker file. Uh, you basically add your binaries, your libraries, your environment variables, things like that, into your Docker file. And then that Docker file renders an image, and then you can run an image, and it becomes a container. So a container is a running instance of an image. So here's this little slide. We've got a little Hello World app that we build into an image. And then we have two different instances of that image running as two containers, container A1 and container A2. Okay, so um, hopefully, we're gonna, hopefully the internet works in here, but you know, usually doesn't. So we're gonna get into uh, the Docker CLI now. So for those of you that do wanna do this, um, I had these grandiose plans of having two laptops and I was gonna have one with the CLI and I'd be going through it with you. Unfortunately, I think I'm just gonna have to pace myself and explain what's happening on the slides. Um, but all the commands are gonna be on the left-hand screen Actually, they're going to be on, on both the left and the right. Uh, in the commands, uh, in the terminal, they're gonna, the command, how the command executes in the terminal is going to be the right-hand screen. And then how the command, uh, the actual commands and their variables will be on the left-hand side when we get to it. So we're going to talk about running a container to start. Um, first, what we're going to do is we're going to pull an image from Docker Hub. We're going to run the image with parameters. And then we're going to go over a couple of management commands. Okay, so we're going to use this all through Docker CLI. It interfaces with the Docker daemon running locally um, over the REST API or in a VM if it's Mac or Windows. Um, and that's going to pull an image into our local image repository, and then Docker Run is going to boot up um, a running container from that image. Okay, so pulling an image from Docker Hub, can everyone see this, or is this really, really small in the back? All right, I'll take your silence as, as uh, it's totally fine. So the command, you, you boot up any, uh, your terminal, your whatever, Terminator, Bash, whatever you want to use. And 
uh, as long as you've installed Docker, which if you looked at the uh, lecture workshop requirements on Startup Salam's website, you should have, you should be able to run Docker pull Redis. Okay, now assuming the internet works, I think it's like a, it's like a hundred and, or it's an 80 megabyte download, so it's not too big. Probably just absolutely trash the internet here, but we'll, we'll see anyone having success with that. All right, one person, excellent, two people, yes, three people. All right, okay, so we're at a good 3%. So, okay, so when you pull this down, you'll see that it does a bunch of, uh, gives a bunch of output, says pulling from library Redis, it says a version, so it default tag is latest, so that's the version number. Uh, we'll see different versions, you can see different versions in Docker Hub if you were to go to the website and search for Redis, you can see all the versions of Redis that exist. Um, each of those hashes after that are different layers that compose the image. And then we get to the bottom, it gives you another SHA-256, eh. And then um, it gives you the status of the ultimate, the ultimate result of this pull, okay? So in this case, we've pulled Redis latest. So we can validate that we actually have it on our system, and that's gonna be the command docker image ls. Okay, so we're just lsing, we're listing the images on our host machine. Okay, you should see something similar to this. Gives you the repository name, the tag, in this case is latest. Uh, the image ID, <clears throat> when it was created. So this is created when it was uploaded to uh, Docker Hub. It's probably different now, because I did this a few days ago. And then the side of the image on your, uh, local hard drive, which is 83.4 megabytes, okay? So we have an image, now we actually wanna run this image. So running this image is pretty straightforward. We do need to pass in a couple of commands. We need to give it the run command, obviously, because we wanna run it. The dash D puts in detached mode. So if we don't run it with D, we're gonna basically run the process uh, and all the output's gonna go to our standard out and block our terminal. To exit out of that, we'd have to do a control C and that would kill the process inside the container. So what we wanna do is we wanna run it detached so it continues to execute. Um, then we can, we'll log into it and take a poke around, but it's still running in the background. And if we control C or whatever, we're not gonna bail out of our container. We also need to publish some ports. So um, Docker doesn't automatically expose things to the host container. And we need to do that explicitly with this flag dash P. Dash P, we have our host port, so that's the host that, or the port we're gonna connect to from our local machine, connecting to the remote port inside the container. Um, that's gonna be the same for both the host and the remote port, 6379, your standard Redis port. Um, and before I continue, so Redis, who knows what Redis is? Okay, that's good. So just for those of you who didn't put your hands up, Redis is an in-memory uh, cache, we'll call it, in-memory cache management service. Um, it just used key value pairs. It's really simple to use. It's fantastic. Very, very fast. Use a lot of web services to cache requests or parse requests that you don't want to have to hit your database for. So we're using Redis uh, eventually with the service that we're going to uh, build ourselves. But we're just going to get it set up here. So um, going back to this slide, we uh, next need to give it a name. So name is just a friendly name for the container that we're running locally. So we have an image name, which is Redis. We wanna give our running container another name, which we can easily identify. In this case, we're gonna call it startup slam underscore Redis. And then space, and then we give the image name that we're trying to run, which is Redis. Okay. So I didn't know this until I started doing some research, but that hash at the very bottom, after you execute the command, is the folder in which the config and the ephemeral volume is mounted on your local machine. So if you go to, I think, var, slash var, sorry? Yeah, it's like var, it might be, might be as simple as var docker for slash that hash, um, but it's in your var, can, var library. Anyway. Okay, so we've, uh, we've got it running. It's just sitting there. Uh, there's two ways we can execute commands inside of a container. One, we can run a brand new container with a specific command that we want to run. We're not going to do that here. Um, we're going to exec into the existing container that is running, and we're going to uh, bash into it. So we're going to create a bash shell, um, and then we're going to run Redis CLI inside of it. Okay, so to do that, we're going to use docker exec, E-X-E-C, 
And then we're going to create an interactive terminal, which is what the I means. And then we're going to create a TTY, pseudo TTY terminal that's going to pump the output uh, to our, to our uh, bash console. Okay, so dash IT and then the name of your container, which we call startup slam underscore Redis. And then space the command we want to execute that's inside the container. Okay, so obviously bin bash, the bin folder exists inside the file system of our container, and obviously bash also exists, otherwise this wouldn't work. Um, and when that executes correctly, you should see something that says, uh, gives you the sort of the, the host name and the username that you're signed in with, which should be root at some hash. Okay, and then the folder you're in. Um, does anyone have any issues with that? Is everyone in, inside the container? Do you, the files are in the computer? Anyone get in there? Okay. So if you want to execute Redis, uh, get into Redis and maybe just play around with it, you can run redis-cli. Um, and here I just key starred, shows, show any keys. Um, I added a key, that startup slam, and then the value is great. And then I got bored and left. So it's not a whole lot we can do. It's, it's definitely a tool to be used by service rather than me uh, adding keys and deleting keys. But this is, uh, shows that it works and shows you how to exec into container and play around with the uh, executables inside. Okay, so um, we're running our container in detached mode. Maybe we want to have a look at the logs running inside. Something's maybe gone wrong, or we just want to validate that things are working correctly. To do that, we can simply run docker logs, the name of the container. All right, so docker log startup slam underscore redis, and that will give us a dump, return us to our terminal prompt. If we want to tail the logs, maybe it's a live web service, we want to see traffic. We can tail the logs using the dash f flag. That will not dump us out to our terminal when the logs are completed. It will just keep tailing them as new information comes in. Should we have exited our container? Yeah, you probably should have. Yeah, I would, uh, so at the last slide, the last command was exit. You should have followed that. <laughs> um, he's, my, he's my boss, so <laughs> that's why. That's why I'm giving him crap. So uh, I'll be much nicer than anyone else. Um, OK, so uh, that's logs. If we want to um, look at running containers, we can use Docker PS. So in uh, Linux, in, on Linux, you can just run PS. It shows you're running service or you're running processes. Docker has a similar analogous command called Docker PS. Um, that will show you're running containers. Okay. So in this case, we have one called startup slam underscore Redis. That makes sense because that's what we're running. Okay, we're all done playing around with Redis. You know, we're kind of played around with adding some keys manually. Let's, let's tear it down. We want to stop it. Maybe we want to change some environment variables. Um, or maybe there's a problem, we just want to reboot it. To do that, we're going to use docker stop and uh, add the container name. Okay, so it will echo back the stopped container. If you're on a docker PS, you should see nothing. It is, and we're going to see on the next slide. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, the Docker stop is sends a sig term. So it get, tells the container, or the root process running the container, to do a graceful shutdown. Um, there's a just as a real quick aside. One thing you do have to be aware of is that when when you create a Docker file and you have a command, the command becomes a PID of one inside your container. And we'll, I'll show you what a command is in a few slides. Um, but most processes that you or I or anybody write don't reap zombie processes. Um, that's something usually a high-level process in the kernel will do. So if you start forking processes inside your container from something like a Python script or uh, whatever that your, uh, your container is running, you'll have a bunch of zombie processes that don't get reaped. So a sig term is is good to gracefully kill your main process. Maybe it's a web server. But if you, for some reason, have forked processes, you're going to end up uh, having a bunch of zombie threads. Um, and then once the container is actually completely nuked, I believe they'll go away. But anyway, so Docker kill uh, sends a sig int to the 
primary process, so the PID1 inside the container, and that is going to just, without any sort of care or due process, destroy uh, the running process in the container, stop the container. So is that like the, the kill? Like a that is, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So be very careful with that. You don't want to be doing that in prod. <laughs> So um, you can view stopped processes using Docker PS-A. Okay, so uh, in this case, I had two. I boot up two Redis instances. I uh, stopped one and left one running. You can see the difference between the two. One says exited six seconds ago. I took a took a screenshot real quick here, and then um, the other one says it's been up for seven seconds. Wow, it was real fast. Okay, anyway, so that's um, that's how Docker PS works. So um, maybe you're all done. You played around with Redis. You're like, you know, this isn't going to work for us. I don't want it living on my host machine anymore. I want to get rid of the image. To get rid of an image, you need to make sure every single container running from that image is dead, stopped or killed. And then you can remove the base image. Docker won't allow you to remove an image that has a container running. Um, so if you haven't already stopped your, or stopped your containers, you want to do that now. And then we can use uh, Docker RM. Oh, I'm sorry. This is remove a container. So this is fine. So the, do the container does need to be stopped for us to remove it. So we're going to remove the container with a Docker RM uh, startup slam underscore Redis. Okay. All the uh, when you do a stop, you're not going to lose any ephemeral data inside your container. When you do a Docker RM, you're going to wipe everything. So you might want to volume out. We're not going to get into volume mounting in this talk because this goes sort of above and beyond the amount of content I wanted to cover. But just be aware that that data inside a container, if it's not volume mounted, is ephemeral, and you will lose it. OK, so removing an image. This is the part where, uh, when you're done playing around with the service, you want to remove any history of it on your local machine. You'd make sure you've stopped or killed all your containers. You remove all your containers, and then you would remove the image. And then you, to do that, you use Docker image RM Redis. Okay, Redis obviously being our image name, not the container name. Okay, so keeping with our nautical theme, we'll move on to our second port of call, the Docker file. So we've gone through, I've given you basically the rudimentary commands you're going to need to operate on the Docker CLI. Okay, um, but now we're going to get into how to actually build an image. We pulled an image down and we're going to build our own. Before we can build our own, I just want to quickly cover what a Docker file is and how it works. Okay, so Docker file is essentially a blueprint for building images. Um, when you type Docker build and then pass in your Docker file name, it sends each of the commands in the Docker file to the Docker daemon, and the Docker daemon is responsible for executing the commands and figuring out what it needs to do. Each command that executes inside the Docker daemon executes from the Docker file, it creates something called an intermediate. Uh, and it's going to be an image layer. Okay, so what that means is that as you build out your image, if for some reason you, uh, you, you, miss, you mess up a command inside your Docker file, it will have successfully executed perhaps the last command, and you'll have a whole history of images that gets you there. So you can exec into that intermediate image and maybe play around with the command you're trying to run in your Docker file, figure out what went wrong, change your Docker file, and then try to rebuild it. So it gives you a way to debug. Your, your Docker file composition. Okay, so we're going to cover basically the main commands. There's a, many other ones. The command reference at the bottom of the screen there. Again, Docker file, or Docker's documentation is really, really good. But we're going to cover from, uh, run, copy, and analogously add, expose, uh, environment, and then command. And command is the command, uh, is the Docker file argument that produces the process, the main process running in the container. So this is what a Docker file looks like. On the left, we have the Docker file. On the right, we have the output from uh, the standard out from your terminal. Okay, so we do Docker build dot. It looks at the first line. It says from Alpine 3.8. So Alpine is a really, really lightweight Linux distribution. I think it's about five megabytes in size. Sure beats the like 800 megabytes of Ubuntu. It's not a lot of stuff you need from Ubuntu to run most services. Um, you don't need a full operating system. You don't need any of the, of the daemons. You don't need any of the memory management, um, the GUI, stuff like that isn't necessary for a lot of things, especially for microservice 
uh, standpoint. So um, we're going to use Alpine. Version is 3.8. And you can see that when it runs, it, uh, it creates a hash. Actually, I think if you guys are running, if you guys execute this, which actually you're not right now because you don't have the Docker file, but um, we'll see in a minute what this is uh, after a Docker after a Docker build has been run once, everything is cached each layer. This is um, this actually this isn't cached. Sorry, um, but you can see there's a hash after each step. So after each step, there's a hash that's uh, an image layer, and we can exec into that if we needed to. Okay, so. Uh, a Docker file builds these, each command is layers each command on top of the other and gives you a final image, which in this case is just a hash of whatever that last line is there, B014. Okay, so we have a Docker file. Uh, each command builds a layer. The final layer is our final image, and the image is what we're going to turn into containers. So let's build a Docker file. So, um, we can, the easiest way to do this is probably to just clone the Git repo for, the, for this uh, workshop. So there's a simple Flask app. It's one file. It's app.py. It's, it's the most useful app in the entire universe. It's a REST service that returns whether a number is a Fibonacci number or even if, if you pass a number to it, if it is that Fibonacci number. Extremely useful. 300 years when we're traveling to space, someone will have to use it to figure out how to jump into hyperspace, I'm sure. <laughs> so um, anyway, it's actually very difficult to come up with examples to like microservice-ize. So this is, uh, especially if you want to use other services like Redis. So basically what this does is um, it's, uh, it's a Flask app that calculates Fibonacci numbers. There's some memoization involved, so it doesn't have to go down each branch of the recursion tree. Uh, by default, it uses just a dict. However, we added Redis, we'll add Redis at the end to do our memoization and caching for each branch of the recursion tree to calculate our Fibonacci numbers. Um, so yeah, this is what it does. So what we want to do is we want to identify a few things here, okay? We want to we identify what we want to actually containerize. We want to containerize our Flask app so we know that we need app.py. We need to containerize our dependencies because they obviously need to be there for our app to run. So that's in requirements.txt. And then I mentioned we have this service dependency called Redis. We're actually going to ignore that for now um, and just get it, get it running and using the dict memoization rather than using Redis for caching. Oh, perfect. I have a slide for that. Um, so, yeah. So, we're going to identify our dependencies, uh, identify the program or program source. And then, uh, if you haven't already, create a file called Dockerfile in the root of the application folder. So if you cloned it without changing the name, it should be the folder should be called Startup Slam. In that folder, create a file called Docker, capital D. Capital D is very important. Dockerfile in the project root. And then you can open it in Sublime or whatever you want to use. Cat and append. Please don't do that. Um, <laughs> So the very, very first line is just like what we said earlier. It's from, we're going to use the base image that we're going to um, base the rest of our image on, so Alpine 3.8. This gives us something like a package manager, which is really important for easily building out a container or building out an image. Um, as I said, it's very, very lightweight. It's only five megabytes, so we can stack more stuff onto it without it getting absolutely enormous in size. So from Alpine, colon. So um, we want to create, obviously, a folder for application to run in. This is up to your personal preference, where you want to put your stuff. Uh, where we are at Telmedic, we create a folder called opt, and then throw our application, our microservice, into the apt folder, or the app folder, not apt, but app. Okay, so we're going to do two things here. This is a, a double ampersand command. So it's, uh, we're going to make an opt directory, and then we're going to make an opt app directory. And then we're going to execute run. So run's going to run something inside the container. APK is the Alpine package manager. Okay. And we want to do an add because we're adding a package. We're not going to use a cache. Um, we're always going to pull it down every time we build this image. And we're going to install Python 3. 
finally, we can use Python 3. It's only been 10 years. Okay, um, <laughs> this is probably more than that actually. Okay, so copy. So copy is going to copy something from your, am I going too fast? Is everyone okay? Do you want me to go back a slide? Yeah? These okay. are all going to the Docker file, right? These are all going to the Docker file, absolutely, yeah. So this, yeah, the thing on the right-hand side is what your Docker file should look like. Um, so the copy is gonna copy from your host machine source to the image or the, the Docker uh, destination. Um, there is another command called add. So copy is specifically for file system files. Add does URLs and you can also untar tarballs into your container when you build them. Um, so copies is like a, a smaller subset of functionality than add. Can you just always use add? You could, yeah. I'm not sure about the implications of using add always. But copy, yeah, that's a good point. Okay. So then what we want to do is we've got our requirements.txt in there. Okay. Um, so we've got our dependencies loaded into our, our image, and now we want to do a pip install. So we're going to run pip3. We're going to pass in the requirements file that we want, and we're going to install our dependencies. That's going to be uh, Flask and uh, Python Redis. Okay, and then finally we want to add our application file into our application folder inside the container. We're going to use the copy command. Is anyone having issues reading the red on the black? Okay. Because I'm just going to say uh, I tried to mirror. I tried to mirror the color scheme of what Sublime uses by default, but looking at that, it's kind of hard to read. Oops. <clears throat> okay. So um, a real quick note about why I added my application at the near the bottom of my file rather than when I added my requirements. I could have certainly just copied in my entire project folder into the op apt folder. The reason that I didn't do that is that because layers are cached, changes in a layer above in the layer hierarchy will cause layers below it to be rebuilt. So if you make a change higher up the chain, everything has to be rebuilt. If we make changes to our, our application logic, it's near the bottom of our, of our Docker file. If it changes, not a big deal. Um, we only have a couple other layers to build rather than, you know, the top or the bottom two thirds of the stack. Um, in this case, it's not a big deal. It's a really small, small service. If you have a huge, huge service with many, you know, hundreds of files, this does become a big deal. And rebuilding everything every time becomes extremely time consuming and unenjoyable. So um, always put stuff that you think is gonna change more often sort of farther down. So that when it gets hashed and cached, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't have to be rebuilt when the cache or when the hash is different. Okay, so um, this is, in my opinion, the most useless command in Docker, the expose <laughs> command. Um, so expose doesn't actually do anything. What it does do in Docker's own words is it's a contract between the container or the image developer and the ultimate user of the image. Uh, it's basically saying that port 5000 is the, the port that the service is running on. Okay, it doesn't actually map to anything automatically, asterisk. Um, but there it is. Yeah. Wait, I mean, wouldn't it be good to like? I mean, it being useless in the sense of Docker, wouldn't it still be good, per se, for readability? Yeah. So what? Well, like, pr precisely. Know precisely. Yeah. Okay. So, as from like a does it do something perspective, yeah, it's, it's useless. But from an informational perspective, it's extremely important. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, yeah. So yeah. So this is this is the uh, the port that we're going to connect to five thousand. Um, I'm doing a bit of an aberration. We're running Flask in a container. Uh, on its uh, using run server, which is frowned upon if this was a production environment, you'd want to be using something like UWSGI and running it that way. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, just about the yeah. expose. So it literally doesn't do anything other than tell the end user where to look. Is yes. It sandbox it in any way? So, it, no. So, yes, asterisk. I'll, I'll explain the asterisk in a couple of slides. So, there is, there is a use case where it does get applied. Um, it's just not one that I would say is used very often because it uses ephemeral port mappings. So I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so we're going to set the mflask environment variable, okay, or the flask app rather environment variable. So that's mf space, 
the name of the environment variable you want to set, and then the value from the environment variable. This lets us just basically type in Flask run somewhere in our container, and it lets it looks up the environment variable and executes that app. Okay, uh, the very very last command. So once this is the command that gets executed when you type Docker run, and that's Flask run, and then we're setting the host to be we're binding the host service to all addresses inside the container. Um, if you try to bind to localhost or local loopback, uh, it won't work. Okay. So, it's really, trust me, this, I wrote, don't worry, I wrote all the slides first and then I came up with these like nautical themes. It wasn't like a nautical theme and then I shoehorned the slides in. Um, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a whale with containers on its back. So, I mean, it's, um, so yeah, we're going to build an image from our Docker file. Okay, so is everyone, does everyone want me to keep this last slide open for a bit longer to finish up? Okay. Yeah. Um, so these, obviously, these files can get very large. If, you were, if we were to look at Alpine even, even though it's only five megabytes, the amount of uh, logic involved, or not logic, but the amount of, the number of commands in that file is qu quite a lot, because it has to build basically our operating system from the ground up. Um, Ubuntu is obviously going to be even larger. Uh, there's a Python 3, 3.8 image that you can download. It basically takes Alpine and then installs a lot more than what we did here into a base Python 3.8 image. Um, images are really good when, if you're using an image in production that you don't have full control over, that may be a bad idea. So it is difficult to generate an image from the very, very ground up, but uh, you have some confidence that security holes, things like that, are entirely in your control, and that someone can inject code into an image you're pulling down from Docker Hub. So, um, to get started, obviously, it's a lot easier to be using um, base images like Alpine, but ultimately, when you go to production, uh, you may want to consider switching into writing your own. Okay, so, um, is everyone, everyone okay? Let me, uh, everyone, everyone okay? You want me to, can we move on? Okay. So if you are behind, um, we can do a git checkout. There's a branch inside uh, the repo called Dockerfile. You can do a git checkout Dockerfile. It has all the commands that we just put in with some comments, I believe. I tried to heavily document it. Um, if for some reason, because of some local changes, you can't download the branch, or uh, check it out rather. I do a git reset hard and then check it out. And that should set you in a state that uh, you can follow along. Okay. Um, so this is, this is it. This is where, where the, the proverbial container meets the waterway. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into our uh, our source root folder, and we're going to execute docker build dot. So the, the dot refers to the current folder. We're setting the context where we want docker to look for the file and that's going to build our image. Okay, so you could path that to whatever you wanted, but we know that we're in the folder, the root folder of our application. Um, so we can just build it in situ with a dot. Okay, so you should see something now, assuming the internet works. Is anyone seeing something similar, downloading images? Is it progressing? Is it not doing it? Okay, so this is good. So yeah, you're seeing a lot of information here. It's basically, it's, it's telling you everything is happening. It's giving you all the standard out from the APK install. Um, once this is built once and you have no changes in your code, all these images are being hashed and cached, and then you don't have to build them again unless there's a change in a layer. Okay, and also, as I mentioned before, if something fails halfway through, you could go into that intermediate image, exec into it, and then maybe poke around and see why the command you tried to run failed. Okay, so this is, if you guys want to try running it again, you can see what I mean. Go a lot faster. It will say using cache for layer. Um, 
And that's about that. If you want to force a rebuild without using caching whatsoever, you can use dash dash no dash cache. And that will force a rebuild without any caching. Um, sometimes the situation where you might want to do that is you have a PyPy upgrade, or an, there's, let me phrase that, a package has been updated in your remote package repository. I'm using a Python example, but same thing for Node or any other remote package repository. Um, the command hasn't changed, and Docker won't be aware of upstream changes that are not relative to the host machine. So say a package has been updated uh, remotely and you're using latest, not a great idea, but if you're using latest, um, it will re-download the package uh, when you use no cache, but it wouldn't if you didn't. Okay, so uh, when we built the image last, um, we, just, uh, we just got a, a hash at the end, an image hash. That's not really great to work with. If we were to type Docker LS or Docker image LS right now, you'd end up seeing a whole bunch of hashes and you would have no idea what, what they were. You'd be like, I don't know what I just built. So we can add you know, friendly names to, to containers or to images, I should say, by adding um, a tag to the build command. So we're calling it startup slam underscore web. I was struggling here. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why I turned a pirate theme, but okay. Um, also, the sinking ship theme was probably a really bad example too, but anyway, um, it, was, it, was, it was a challenge. So okay, we're going to run a container from here. So we're here. We finally did it, guys. Good, good job. We now have this image on our local machine that we want to run. We want to have this great service. We want to, we want to find all the Fibonacci numbers. I want to find out if five is the hundredth Fibonacci number. Don't know why I wouldn't know that it isn't, but I'm going to find out anyway. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to boot up our, our uh, container into an image using this command, uh, docker run command. We're going to pass in a port mapping. We're going to map our local port 8000 to the container port 5000 because we looked at the Docker file and said, oh look, it's exposed on 5000. Um, and then we're gonna set a friendly name, so dash dash name, startup slam underscore web, so that's the name of the image, and then underscore run, which means that the image is, has uh, the base name of, or the container has the base name of the image, and then the run tells us that it's a running instance of the startup slam web image. Okay. So you can call it whatever you want, this is just sort of a, a good rule of thumb so you know sort of the derivative of your container. And then obviously we need the image that we're, uh, we're booting our container from, and that startup slam web, which we defined in the previous slide. Please ignore the last line on the left there. That is totally incorrect. OK. Um, so use the commands on the left, not on the right, please. There's a bit of discrepancy there. Um, so I talked about how expose 5000 doesn't do anything, asterisk. The asterisk being that if you use the dash P, capital P command, or flag, when you use Docker run, it will map an ephemeral higher order port on the host machine, some random port, to uh, the port that's exposed. Uh, you could use this um, and then do like a Docker PS to see what port was mapped. You can see when you run a Docker PS, it will output the local host port and then what it, what it maps to inside the container. Um, it's, I think it's better to have explicit ports so you know what you're doing, especially if you have a whole bunch of services running locally. You know how to connect to them based on their port numbers. So that's just a little tidbit of information. It's not. I would say it's not used by us at Telmedic at all. Okay, so how's everyone feeling? Is everyone up to speed so far? Everyone need me to take a few slides back, get cut up, explain anything more before we move into the next little bit here? Okay, so at the very beginning, uh, as a proof of concept and how to sort of play around with the Docker CLI, we booted Redis. Um, if you were to run, if you were to do a curl against your local host 
port 5000. Um, actually, should work. If you were to do a curl, this is just a get, do a curl get. Um, sorry, port 8000 against fib, say 10, you should, if your service is running still, get back the 10th Fibonacci number. Anybody? Any takers? Do we have, do we have a positive? Okay, this is good. Okay, so we're all on the same page. I'm very happy about this. It's very difficult to know if, everyone's, if everything's worked the way it should since I'm not actually doing this myself. Um, although I did do it myself many times before, everything always falls apart game day, right? Um, so I'm glad it hasn't. Okay, so uh, we know it's working. Now what we want to do is we want to now roll into adding a Redis service, not using the DIT caching, and um, use Redis instead. So Docker has multiple network types. We have bridge mode, hosts, uh, overlays, and Mac VLANs. I'm not going to get into any of those other ones except for bridge networking, just because it's a whole other kettle of fish. You could talk for another couple of hours about it. Um, bridge networking provides networking between containers. That's, that's about it. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to connect our service to Redis. It's going to be super easy to do. I'm going to create a network first. So Docker has a network command, Docker network create, and then the name of the network we want to create, in this case, startup slam. Okay. Oh. Anyway. Um, and we're going to want to also boot up a Redis instance as well. Okay. So, um, We should, uh, let me going to quickly change the slide here. Oops. Mm. No, let's just do this. You might need to do a Docker pull Redis again if you've uh, removed your image. Oops, on Redis. Oops, on web. <coughs> okay. okay. So, um, we need to create a network. We're going to connect uh, startup slam web run to our network. Okay. So the network name comes first, then the running container name. And then we are going to do a, uh, a docker run dash g dash dash name Redis on the Redis image to boot up the Redis image. If you guys did a uh, docker image rm Redis, oops. Um, um, you're going to have to re repull it. So you're going to have to do a Docker pull. Redis. Okay. And then uh, the ultimate command to enable Redis inside our Flask app is to pass in an environment variable. And this is the, so the last fly command for Docker that I'm going to give you is dash E, which sets an environment variable inside the running container. And that is Redis underscore enabled equals true. you will probably get an error when you run that last command saying that the image is running or the container is already running. So you're going to have to stop it and then bring it back up with this command. So can anyone successfully curl against the local host and get back a result after they turn on Redis caching?
Anyone having issues? What? So what? What are we? What, what issues? Oh, sorry. Once we, uh, once we create a set of time web. Oh, right here. Sorry. Startup Slam Web is the image name. Yes. So when we when we created our Docker when we had our Docker file we did a Docker build dot dash dash tag yes. Startup Slam underscore web. And then um, here I'm gonna fix this too. So this should be more correct. I went through a few iterations on how this should look. Let's get a typo there. Let's just fix that. OK. All right. Uh, any other commands that people are having? Is, is anyone getting any word output? Any bad output that? Uh, Perfect. Okay. Well, that's it's probably because Redis isn't connected. I would imagine. Okay. So what? Here, let's uh, let's do a real quick peek here. I'm gonna five more minutes. Is that? Yeah. yeah? Five okay. Um, let's do a real quick. All oh, right. I just realized I'm on my own laptop. Um, okay. What I'm gonna do is we can talk about this afterwards, and I'm gonna wrap this presentation. Okay. So. Ideally, what's supposed to happen here is that you connect your services. Oh, yeah. This is good. OK, I see people squinting and looking at the screen. This is good. Um, so the first thing we do is the top line is we create a network. Second line is we're booting Redis back up. Third line is we are connecting Redis to the network. Um, sorry, first line is we're uh, connecting our running container for the Startup Slam application to the network. Then we're adding, we're booting Redis, we're adding Redis to the network, and then we're uh, starting our um, Startup Slam web container with the Redis enabled flag set to true. How? You should be able to run curl against the local host, um, and it should return whatever the 10th Fibonacci number is, ideally. Ideally. No. So because we've connected things inside the container, um, or because we have two containers inside the same network, uh, they can communicate in any port, over any port together. OK, I'm going to uh, unfortunately have to move on here. Um, we can talk about this afterwards. I'm sorry that it didn't quite work out, but such is real life, I suppose. Um, it was still a great workshop. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Um, it's not over yet. Uh, so a quick recap. We talked about the benefits of Docker, gave you a brief introduction to the architecture ecosystem. We talked about the CLI. We talked about the Docker daemon, how the local host has a Docker daemon, and you have your images and containers all managed through the Docker daemon. Uh, we talked about Docker Hub, which is this private and public repository of images. Briefly touched on Docker versus virtualization, how Docker is much more lightweight, usually is one process per container, uh, less memory footprint, things like that. Uh, we build your own container. Um, it'd been great if we could build an app from scratch, I suppose, but we can't, we don't have, you know, three hours to go through the whole, the whole process. Um, but we had a, an app that we wanted to Dockerize. We used a Docker file to build it out, and then we ran it. We ran it with some uh, some environment with some config so that we could connect to it from our local host using port publishing. And then we added a service dependency. In this case, it was Redis, uh, allowing us to do some networking. And uh, we didn't get to it, but we showed how Docker Compose simplifies service management. Um, if you guys want, do want to get it working. I strongly encourage you to, in your application route, you can do a git, uh, you're going to wipe your stuff doing this, but do a git reset dash dash hard, and then do a git checkout docker compose capital D capital C, 
And that will give you a compose file. I don't have a board space. But you can run a docker compose up dash D. That will boot your entire stack and it will just work. And then all the stuff we just talked about is totally pointless. <laughs> so, but, you know, I have one, one more slide. There we go. I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, it's really important for, you know, you younger folk. I'm not that old, I should be saying that. But you, people who are still in school to get involved in learning about some technologies that are up and coming or well established. I want to thank everyone at Telmedic, uh, Adam, Alex, Chris, Ivan, Justin, James, Kim, and Matt for helping compose these slides. They've been uh, fantastic. Uh, send with us, for organizing the event, and uh, check front for doing what you guys did. Yeah, workday story, workday. Oh. Uh, oh. uh, and of course, Docker for providing a safe harbor in the Gale Stormer production SLAs. So. <laughs> There we go. Thank you all for listening. I've been your captain. See you later. So, um, I know lunch, there's going to be plenty of lunch, so don't worry, you have a full hour. I do have a couple of questions uh, for Jamie. We have three minutes, guys. <laughs> you can, I will be around. You guys can, you know, harass me if you want over lunch. Uh, Draw prizes. We have a bunch of draw prizes from Workday Startup Slam and Telmedic. So, um, I, this is from Confused Boyo. I thought we were exposing port 5000. Why do we have to use port 8000 with, cur with curl them? Great question. So, we're, um, there's two things happening here. One, we have the internal Docker network, which is essentially firewalled to our local host. And so what we're doing here is we're creating a port mapping from our external, or to provide an external connection to our Docker container. So internally, we have inside the container, we have a service running on port 5000 that has been firewalled. We can't connect to it. So we're going to poke a hole through that firewall from the local host port 8000 into the container's port 5000, allowing us to connect from our local host port 8000 into the container port 5000. Is that clear as mud? Yeah. You you could use you could use whatever you want. It could even be a boat. <laughs> Sorry, it's probably it's an old joke. It's an old Family Guy joke. Um, but yeah, you could. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So any any port works. Um, you could use dash p, obviously. Um, but you know, random higher level order ports are kind of you know just, just pick one and use whatever. You can use port eighty. It doesn't matter. Can you reiterate uh, where these slides are available for people after this workshop? They're on the GitHub page, um, available right now. Um, at the very, very first slide here. You might want to make it open. Open. Yeah, because it was actually requesting access. Was, oh, was it? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, um, I'll fix that. <laughs> um, let's see your share. So Jamie will work on that. Is there any other questions? Any uh, burning questions? Yes. Uh, what was that command again for Docker Compose? So it's going to be Docker dash Compose, yeah. uh, a lowercase uh, space up, space dash D. And that will boot everything in detached mode. Yeah? I don't think that branch was working. This uh, Docker Compose branch. Yeah. Uh, I'd get reset hard and there was no other branch. Did you do a, did you do a git checkout do, capital D Docker capital C Compose? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, it's a separate branch, yeah. yeah. And you'll, there should be a Docker Compose file in there. Yeah. Okay, last question. Yeah. Right, so, so how does the uh, development workflow uh, work with Docker? Do you kind of uh, have the container that like you use the entire time, or do you rebuild every time you commit a change? Or? So the way that we do it at Telmedic is um, Developers basically own a product to some degree, so that a developer will start writing an application, and when before they even let me phrase it, before they even start writing an application, they'll get a base image built using a Docker file, getting the Docker Compose file set up, and then uh, when they start adding code to it, you do do an image rebuild and you do re-up a container with the run command. So as the code changes, you're going to have to rebuild your images, unless it's volume mounted. But we won't get into that. <laughs> All right. And Jamie's available, of course, during lunch. Are you doing Ask an Expert today or no? Uh, not officially, but sure. Not Why not? Not officially, but sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, so let's give Jamie a big hand. Thank you. Thank you. So